much, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the Revive Portal uh, postgraduate lecture series. And uh, we are very fortunate to have with us again, uh, as we've had in the past, Dr. Bhaskar. He is a dear friend, uh, a very, very good academic, though he doesn't like to call himself an academic. He likes to call himself a clinician, and I agree. But uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's uh, uh, somebody who's inspired a lot of us to revisit the concept of psychiatry. And uh, he's encouraged us to read more, to learn more. And uh, we are happy to have him back with us on this call. Uh, to share the session today, we have with us Dr. Naresh uh, Vadlamani. I hope hmm. I'm getting the pronunciation right, Dr. Naresh. Uh, he is going to chair the session today. Dr. Uh, Naresh is the chief consultant psychiatrist at the Columbus Hospital and Institute of Psychiatry and Neurosciences and De Addiction at Hyderabad. He is also an associate professor of psychiatry at the Apollo Institute of Medical Sciences and Research. He was the ex assistant professor at the Bhaskara Medical College. Uh, he is the founder and chairman of Wish to Live Foundation, Hyderabad Suicide Prevention Center. He's been the IPS, he's a national uh, IPS national GC member, South Zone representative uh, from 21 to 24. He's an ESIC coordinator on various task force uh, at various points in time. He's been the ex chairperson as well on various task force. He has an exemplary record uh, in terms of academics, but also in terms of the positions he has held at the IPS. And uh, it's a privilege to have it, uh, have it him, uh, have him on board with us today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bhaskar and Dr. Naresh, mm. for making time and gracing us with your presence. And uh, I now hand over the proceedings of the evening to Dr. Naresh. I'll come back at the end to give the word of thanks. Over to yeah. you, Dr. Naresh. Thank you. Mm. Very much. Thank you, Rajman, and uh, welcome, Doctor. Uh, well, it is a very eagerly waited uh, session uh, over the last mm. more than two weeks when I came to know that we'll be doing this session. Mm. And uh, this particular topic, the DSM, ICD-10, as the ICD, as oh. well as uh, the brain, is, mm. I think, it's very close to Dr. Bhaskar as well. <laughs> and, uh, hmm. uh, I mean, uh, he's a very humble Jain, let me tell you that. And uh, he always considers himself as a student of psychiatry, the medical discipline dealing with full working and dysfunction of the brain and brain only. Molecular biology is where, I mean, in his own words, where he feels most comfortable. And psychiatry is molecular psychiatry and nothing else. And he says that, I love to understand and evaluate the pathophysiological basis of psychiatric symptoms, both macroscopically and microscopically. Mm -hmm. going from connectonomics to genomics. And he says that his interest areas are treatment resistance in psychiatry and transdiagnostic understanding of psychiatry. So, yes, I mean, with the brief introduction that he has, I mean, he shows that he has a lot of humbleness and humility. And uh, let me tell you that I have learned a lot from him too. And probably he was one of the most influencers when we talk about social media, yeah, he is one of the one who has the maximum following probably of being an influencer in the thought process of what psychiatry is and deviating it towards the brain rather than towards the mind. Right. And with a few words, and let me give you my own introduction that the history-wise, when you talk about DSM, ICD-10, they were categorical because people at probably at that age thought that it was like an infection and an infection has an organism as an origin and then it has a cluster of symptoms. So a disease should have a cluster of symptoms which is categorical and boxed, right? So with that concept in mind, and which is very easier to understand as well. So they try to classify the diseases from DSM 1, 2, 3, 4. And I was doing my PG when I was... Uh, doing and um, when there was DSM-4 and ICD-10. And let me tell you, I'm a very good student even today. And during those days, 
I did by heart ICD-10 and DSM-4. And I was of the opinion that, yes, diseases were categorical and there was, there was a clear demarcation between illnesses and illnesses. Gradually, over a period of time, as probably the newer and newer understanding grew, as well as some insights into genetics as well, and thanks to Bhaskar, giving me some insights into those genetic aspect of functioning of the neurons. Now we come to know, or at least at the present moment, I'm coming to learn that, yes, there are some poor symptoms of an illness, but then the, it branches out to have multiple symptoms presenting in various points of time, manifesting as various illnesses, various symptoms. So it is not what is called as limited to one organ like the brain when we talk about depressive illness or any other illness, but then we are talking about the systemic illnesses or systemic symptoms which develop from one organ to another organ. Right. So with this brief understanding which I have, and even today I'm going to, have to learn more from what Bhaskar might be saying. So I will not uh, keep every one of you waiting. So... Let us jump into it and listen to what Bhaskar has to say. Welcome, Bhaskar. And the whole show is yours. You need to unmute. Bhaskar, oh yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And specifically, thank you for not going in details about introduction. I don't like introduction. Because ultimately, we all are here to learn and discuss. And standing there, we are just a group of senior students talking to a group of junior students. That is enough. So why this lecture came into being? I was thinking that if we want to talk about psychiatry and if you want to make it go forward, then we have to first address what is really wrong in psychiatry and nothing better than talking about DSM and ICD if we really want to talk about how and where psychiatry went wrong. Make no mistake, our branch is a wrong branch. I know most of you don't like to hear this thing. You would say, no, we have done a lot of things, we have done this and that. No. Whatever we have done, we have stayed 100 years behind, at least, if not more, from other medical specialties. In no other medical specialty, one has to question still today whether they are, what they are treating. Psychiatrists are still not sure what they are treating, whether it, they are treating brain or mind. Psychiatrists are still today even not sure what their drugs are doing because drugs have been labeled according to DSM and ICD. Unfortunately, drugs like brain knows no artificial human binary and they treat the whole brain. Standing there, ultimately, drugs do much more than what they are supposed to do, and drugs do not do what they what we told them to do. And that is where the all problem comes. So naming of the drug is wrong in our current nomenclature. In our current nomenclature, we have done even bigger wrongs. We have made something which is not a disease. You, in this course of this lecture, you would come to know. And if you are interested, later you would also read that before 1980, there was no disease as depression. There was no disease at, as anxiety. There was no disease as phobia. There was no disease as any of the frequently seen patients that we treat, and in 1980, how it became 
known as disease because a group of people due to their own interest and they are due to their own maneuvering created all these things so standing there the classification of psychiatry is probably the biggest bane of psychiatry this two part lecture series is our way to understand why that happened and why that happened would be the first part second part is what we can do about it so next week we are going to discuss what we are going to do about it today we we'll talk in very small thing about how, uh, what we are going to do, uh, do about it in next class or rather next seminar we we'll would talk more about it. today it is how we have landed in this peculiar area and with this introduction let's go to the presentation proper uh, i need to have uh, scaring enabled please make me co-presenter please make me co-presenter otherwise it's not possible yes can we make uh, bastard the host so that he can share his slides on his own co-host could do yes sir you can share sir directly you can share directly okay oh, that's okay. good mm -hmm. okay. okay okay done done, done. Hmm. so i am scaring i am starting to share my screen hmm so let's go to the presentation proper this is a small presentation because recently i have realized encyclopedic presentation doesn't make our audience learn more so i have started more on talking more on giving the audience idea rather than cramming a lot into slides so this would be a small slide. roughly we ha i have 25 slides but i would talk much more and i would explain things much more so dsm icd and brain it is actually tale of two gardeners who have no garden and a lot of fooling around destroying science the problem problem statement would be let's define the problem the superficially the problem is there is no medical identity in psychiatry rather whenever we talk about medical things people say that is medical point of view not understanding that in science there is no point of view either you have it or you don't have it point of view doesn't come in psychiatry but unfortunately in psychiatry what we have is point of view. then comes there is no typical pathophysiology anywhere in brain for any of the entities of dsm or icd if we talk about neurological finding then every thing in icd and dsm can be summarized into hypofrontality in functional neuroimaging then would come basal ganglia hyperactivity then would come cerebellar hyperactivity and lastly there would be hyperactivity in anterior cingulate sometimes posterior cingulate insula and orbitofrontal cortex that is the end of all functional neuroradiological finding in everything in psychiatry now if we come to structural neuroimaging in structural neuroimaging we would see that a lot of different categories of atrophy in frontal lobe temporal lobe and along with that sometimes loss of hippocampal volume that's all no 
DSM or ICD entity anywhere says more than that has not been associated with anything else. Now, longitudinal stability, one of the sore thumbs of all these diagnostic entities. And you'd find very less paper support in this area because people have stopped researching in the idea. In 1990, 2000, there were a group of people who are actually trying to see, and they have found longitudinal stability of three or of five years is dismal in all DSM and ICD diagnoses. So-called schizophrenia has most 70%. That too, it is debated in a lot of various papers. Anything else, no stability. So what we are dealing with, but again, if you see in last four to five years paper, Google Scholar has a unique uh, criteria. It shows last four years paper separately. If you see that, you would find out nobody talks about it. No long, no paper on longitudinal stability of this data. No paper examining critically the stability because that is another thing publication bias which is actually suppressing the research because people have seen that asking validity asking longitudinal stability makes paper unpublished so they have started pleasing the publishers and lastly, and probably the most importantly, these nosological entities doesn't really say what would happen in the long run. Let's say all of you who are PGTs, specifically who are the final year PGTs, you have seen at least a, a hundred patient in last three years where you have started with depression, anything, whatever it may be. Then after some day you have found out psychosis. Then after some day you might have found out something else. And then the patient dropped out. You don't even know what is that. Also, we have faced another group of patients who in past records have been shown to develop every kind of psychiatric symptomology and is now presenting for various dementia syndromes. So what is the DSM ICD names doing to the natural progression of these diseases? Nobody knows because these names, be it depression, be it Psychosis has no impact on long-term natural progression of brain damage. This slide would be a lot of bring out controversy because nobody would like to hear that Freud is a fraud. But the ultimate fact is Freud was possibly the biggest fraud of 20th, 20th century. Even if we include other psychologists, he was at top because his theories and his observation has no proof. And only Anna, which may or, who may or may not have even existed, is inspiration of all theories and observations of Freud. If you go into real unbiased uh, uh, biography of Freud, you would understand that Freud seamlessly stole his mentor's ideas and refined them. Freud didn't even 
actually invented any of his things. This was, this was invented by Sarko, his mentor and neurologist. These ideas were taken from Sarko by Freud and he shamelessly just claimed himself to be the original person who is doing that. What was Freud's age over Sarko? Freud was a gifted author. Probably the most gifted English literature writer after Shakespeare. If any of you want to know English literature well, I would suggest reading the 32 volumes of Freud. The English is excellent. But that is the only best thing about it. Then after Freud, the next one to come into limelight is Isaac. The Isaac who is still worshipped as one of the founders of psychiatry. If you go through retraction watch as well as Papier and various other scientific wrongdoing detecting websites, you would see these people residing in Hall of Fame of scientific thieving and scientific forgery. Every one of them who gave psychological explanation of external phenomena that is observed in psychiatric patient have done either moral or ethical or statistical wrong way. This is one of those paper which is now known as one of the huge scientific scandal of Isaac. So all the pioneers of psychiatry has committed scientific misconduct, has proved Richard Feynman correct on his comments of social science and this type of science as pseudoscience. So all the explanation of psychopathologies are wrong. So how can psychopathology-based systems be right? I think I, a kind of pseudoscience that- I would like everyone to science hear this. is an example of a science which is not a science. They don't do scientific. They follow the forms. Uh, you gather data, you do so and so and so forth, but they don't get any laws. They don't haven't found out anything. They haven't got anywhere yet. Maybe someday they will, but it's not very well developed. But what happens is, at an even more mundane level, we get experts on everything. It sounds like they're sort of scientific. Now, I might be quite wrong. Maybe they do know all this thing, but I don't think I'm wrong. See, I have the advantage of having found out how hard it is to get to really know something, how careful you have to be about checking the experiments, how easy it is to make mistakes and fool yourself. I know what it means to know something. And therefore, I can't, I see how they get their information. And I can't believe that they know it. They haven't done the work necessary, haven't done the checks necessary, haven't done the care necessary. I have a great suspicion that they don't know that this stuff is don't know and they're intimidating people by it. I, I think so I, I don't know the world very well but that's what I think and I would echo the same sentiments about all the founding fathers and mother in case of Anna Freud of psychiatry uh, psychology and the mixture of it, which now goes in the name of psychology, psychology and psychiatry. 
So, now then comes superficial problems changing into deep problems, the transitional problems. Kreplin, when he started his research, observational research, in dementia precox, he came into the conclusion of the dichotomy that some of the dementia precox patients have a faster course, a worse course, and die very early. Some do not go through that path. The was his only classification based on major psychosis. Nothing else. He never told that this is true for everything else. It is not true for so-called depression. It is not true for so-called anxiety. It is not true for anything else. His stance, his understanding was limited to major psychosis. And he gave everything based on major psychosis. And although criterion dichotomy would be irrelevant in today's standards, but at his time, he had done a very good research. We must congratulate Kreplin. But next, followers of Kreplin's, who were ironically calling them neo Kreplinian, and unfortunately, who were the founder of DSM3, extended Kreplin's concept into a lot of nonsensical names they invented, or rather borrowed from common names. Let me tell you how DSM-3 came into being. Each of the things that I would say next would be actually scientifically accurate. Any of you who want to know these historical facts can contact me. I would give them every references. Now, let me tell you a story the story of eclectism in psychiatry and how that disturbed psychiatry. I would start with Karl Myers. Myers was one of the most influential psychiatrists during first World War period. He was president of American Psychiatric Association and he was very eclectic in nature. Means for him, Anything goes as long as it fits idea of healing of a patient. So he created a version of psychiatry, which is known as psychobiology. What is psychobiology? Psychobiology is something that accepts that there is biological factor in all psychiatric disease it is universal biological factor, but mass also know that at his time there was no treatment for any biological factors. So he tried to focus more on psychosocial factor or rather social factors to bring about changes in psychiatry. That is his psychobiology. Psychobiology was created to fight dogmatism of psychoanalysis. And for anyone who is wondering, psychobiology theory is quite familiar sounding. Look no further. Psychobiology theory is the basis of the biopsychosocial model that is being put in your head by your syllabus and your textbooks. Then after Maya, come Roy Grissinger. Roy Grissinger was actually doing a lot of biological researches in spite of 
being someone who has been treated by psych Freud with psychoanalysis. Roy Grinker and Roy Grissinger, these two Roy have contributed a lot to psychiatry and scientific outlook of psychiatry. Anyway, Roy Grissinger has created biopsychosocial name. His biopsychosocial was exactly opposite of current biopsychosocial. It was to say, yes, psychosocial factors are important, but it culminates in brain. It is biological. Then, he also gave all the ideas about biopsychosocial and how it should work. So what did Engel do? Nothing. Just another scientific forgery and misconduct where he being a physician wanted to rival his uncle who was a famous physician of that time but couldn't do it. So he went to learn psychoanalysis for five years and then came to know about Grissinger and his theories and his uh, nature of theories. And he unceremoniously stole Grissinger's idea and published it in the name of biopsychosocial theory of Engel. Two times. One is 1978, other one is 1980. 1978, it was in American Journal of Physicians, that is JAMA, Journal of Americans, uh, American Medical Association. American Medical, that paper was unanimously rejected and thrown to garbage pit by his physician colleagues. Then in 1980, he again published the same thing in Journal of American Psychiatric Association. Now, 1980 is the break point of a lot of things. At that time, a group of people who were trying to revive psychoanalysis in terms of psychodynamics and other things, in those terms, they were working to create a new classification based on what Kreflin did, but to all the fields, without even bothering whether that way of Kreflinian classification should be applied to all symptoms or not. These people, in association with other supporters of Engel, let Engel publish the 1980 paper, and those papers have satisfied the psychoanalysis people, have satisfied other psychological people, have satisfied sociologists in psychiatry, and have satisfied this new group of neo Kreplinians who were trying to create DSM 3 in their idea. So that is the point where the biopsychosocial theory, which was created to fight psychoanalysis, have become unwilling conveyor of psychoanalysis into psychiatry back again. These people have created the name of depression, the name of anxiety, the name of dysthymia, the name of phobia, the name of and, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, the name of phobic anxiety disorder, the name of everything except major psychosis, that is bipolar and schizophrenia. These people have created the classification that we know now, to, starting in DSM-3. So you see the trans transitional problem is the real bad problem of psychiatry because there are a lot of people 
have changed psychiatry and the meaning of psychiatry due to their own reason. So, with the story, you can now understand that depression never existed before in scientific literature. So as anxiety, panic disorder, phobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, the all pervasive trauma of psychiatry, and these associated disorders like PTSD, stress reaction, all were created and made into nosological entity by new Europeans in their political nosology system. Because this nosology system has no relationship with any of the scientific facts. The names of dysphoria, multiple categories of previous personality disorder, anxiety disorder in block were also picked up from common language and given biological nosological factors to give lifeline life to the dying practice of psychoanalysis. Till today, you would find dysphoria, specific phobia, phobic anxiety disorder, phobia and things like that are being treated by mostly psychotherapies and various psychological means because they were created to give psychologists and psychoanalysis a lifeline so that they can earn. And the tradition is still continuing today. And as usual, Nasir Gami is on that on this matter much before me. Although he sees psychiatry from opposite point of view, he is more interested in public health and social uh, perspective. But here at least, me and Nasir Gami think same that this whole nosological system is unscientific. And the neocryptinian nosology has destroyed psychiatry. Now, that there are even worse problems than superficial or transitional problems. That would be the deep problems. There is no way to prove the existence of any nosological entity. I am saying I am feeling low, so I am depressed. Can any of you prove that I am not depressed? Or can any of you prove I am depressed? Not possible. There is no way which would exclude or prove any of the claims. Similarly, it is true for all DSM diagnoses. So if there is no way to prove this thing, then all the studies that use these neurological entities to find treatment for them are becoming pointless. Let's say we find these and these medications are good for depression. Now, if the depression is not a nosological entity, depression has no existence in science, then how can we say that these drugs are affecting depression? How can we even say these drugs are affecting depression in that way or do this way because there is no way to prove I am depressed my will to say I am feeling bad my will to say not say I am not feeling bad that's, that's all this is a huge problem because this makes all the studies null and void now, if this is true, then think all the neuroimaging studies focused on seeing brain changes in these baseless neural entities 
they are proving themselves wrong and non replicable because they are finding similar patterns everywhere and that is what is happening we can sum up the whole neuroimaging of psychiatry in a paragraph and that will be same for everything then if everything is based on what i am saying then where is normalcy we cannot make anything normal or abnormal because we are defining based on what a person is saying so we are medicalizing the non medical things and we are non medicalizing the medical thing in psychiatry there is no demarcation and ultimately anything or anyone can be proven it that is why all the fmri studies have been proven wrong by the dead fish because dead fish brain also has functional neuroimaging activation if anyone is interested they can read about dead fish and fmri now all brain has com multiple complex cognitive behavioral social somatic and sensory motor traits and each of these complex traits are again formed by thousands of smaller normative non specific traits more specific traits for example let's say i talk about impulsivity impulsivity is a small trait rather than huge cognitive expression huge behavioral expression huge somatic and sensory expression and motor expression but impulsivity is a cross diagnostic trait impulsivity is found in almost all so called psychiatric diagnoses and it is being performed by a lot of pathways in brain all of which are dysfunctional in all psychiatric symptoms so standing there either we have to accept that the complete psychiatric nosology is worthless or we have to accept that there is no point in talking about real brain traits now second one is impossible we have to talk about real brain trait to treat the patient so we have to accept that psychiatric nosology is pointless and impulsivity as we are talking about it is a normative trait too a lot of people who have never been diagnosed by anything would also have impulsivity and impulsive behavior is a common trait in any animal which is under threat so by working with this imaginary colloquial language based neurological entity we are trying to divide off an ocean with floating net this has ended every scientific credibility and its research result no research result has any validity at this moment that is where we are standing this and this that and that in at depression this genetic trait in depression who said that who has examined those genes in biological bipolar who has examined those genes those same genes in ocd who has examined those same genes in anxiety in whatever you want to feel if you want to know i can send you paper on each gene that has been diagnosed to have relationship with depression would also have relationship with depression relationship with ocd relationship with anxiety i can send you paper on each of them i have the collection so where are we standing the genetic basis in doldrum neuroimaging studies has no meaning all 
the papers, all the research has no meaning. And we are talking about evidence-based psychiatry, but there is no evidence. Now, if we are talking about diseases, there has to be pathophysiology. Now, genetics of everything is same. Epigenetics of everything is same. Various omics pathways of everything is same. Microcircuits involved in everything is same. Local network involved in everything is same. Large scale network in everything is same. So either we are bluffing to ourselves or we have to understand everything is present in everything. So if almost all nojodotal entities are colloquial language terms given specific imaginary meaning, then the name of antipsychotic, antidepressant, antimanic has no meaning. Do they have any meaning? They don't have. So why we are, uh, we are bound to use antipsychotic only in psychosis? Who said that antipsychotics are not going to be useful for uh, depression, not going to be useful for OCD? Who gave the uh, guideline authors authority to bar use of this drug in here, in this symptom, and to approve use of this drug in this symptom? Who gave them authority when there is no authority in anything? Our drugs are drugs which work systematically and cerebrally, affecting every biological activity. So why limit them with imaginary scaremonging of DSM and ICD? You cannot give antidepressant in uh, bipolar. Who said that? Long-term antidepressant is probably one of the most effective treatment for relapse prevention in mania. But our imaginary scaremongering the guidelines have deprived patients of the choice. Patients have been deprived of their right to live due to these imaginary guidelines and imaginary uh, DSM and ICD on which these guidelines are based. And also, lastly, all psychiatry is manhandling and mishandling of patients. That is why our patients go into treatment resistance. No, there is no treatment resistance anywhere in non communicable diseases. There are treatment refractory conditions. There are progressive diseases. But there is no treatment resistance in any non communicable diseases. So why the real root of all non communicable diseases and the diseases of brain, they are being restricted and made resistant. Now, evidence-based medicine in psychiatry, another odd thing. We have, we follow the statistical analysis of biomedical, biomedicine. But have we found anything? Have we found any rule that dictates what we should do and what we should be doing? If DSM and ICD nosological entities are just common language terms adopted and used as disease phenotype with no dedicated pathophysiology, then what the ICDs are trying to see and what meta analysis are trying to pull it and compare? There is no basis of our cities. RCT for depression and RCT for uh, mania. What makes those two patients different? Except one is dancing and one is in uh, severe uh, suicidal ideations. What is the evidence base if neurology is fully imaginary with no brain up to anywhere? Have we asked this question? Have we asked ourselves, our two students, and the people? These things, no. Example of deeper problems by a single entity. Let's talk about behavioral addiction. Let's say, 
how can there be behavioral addiction since long as long as humanity is there human beings are particularly favorable to some habits unfavorable to some other habits and each of us has one or two habits which we love if you tell me that when i am well at present i am not well when i am well i have to sleep by 10 pm i would revolt because staying awake till late night seeing how the world sleeps and doing whatever i want to do is one of the main attraction of my life and i am not going to compromise with that thing each of you would find out you have one or two habits like that so are you addicted to that thing behavioral addiction uh, someone is keeping the mic open please check it so we are making behavioral addiction term based on social uh, direction rather than any scientific conviction behavioral addiction is a trait that is distributed normatively in human population some would resist changing of their habit by killing other person some would sulk some would try to compromise but would find life hard to continue so why make someone using mobile phone an addict and someone doing gardening every day and fighting with people if one of their uh, uh, trees die as non addict is there any scientific logic why make someone an addict who is trying to play internet games and not make someone an addict who is killing other people in name of religion or discriminating other people based on their food habit and killing other people based on their food habit why one group of people is normal another group of people who are not doing anything by that sort is is disease behavioral addiction is actually an ideal example of how fallacy as our whole diagnosis is so here i would like to stop because in next part we are talking about what is the solution right um, i would like hmm, any question from any hmm. hmm. yes hello muy ek minute सुप्रिया सालों के यस कन्नड़ यस सुप्रिया यस एनी वन हैव आर एनी क्वेश्चंस right um thank you master i think it was a wonderful introduction to the series i mean bahubali 1 and bahubali 2 we say we were all eagerly waiting for bahubali 2 but actually mm. bahubali 1 is necessary as well so it is very important for us to know the history and it is very important us to what we say as unlearn what we have already learned so 
that will keep our brain fresh and probably the next part we will continue to learn yeah. the new concepts and i mean as the lecture goes on for the next part and yeah so there's hmm. a question i think someone has typed so let me go for that can you elaborate how yes, yes, yes. rcts yes are also worthless as diagnostic systems are deficient for example let's talk about you let me frame our the rct for you you take a group of schizophrenia patients you try a group of uh, uh, patients among this universe on amisulfide you try another group on olanzapine you try the third group on prozapine and you try the fourth group on nothing and then you compare this is a very standard rcd method problem is only one who said that the patients you have collected at schizophrenia has any common pathology in brain is there any common pathophysiology in brain in these people no there is not so if they don't have any common pathophysiology in brain how can they are expected to respond to a specific treatment similarly so if amisulfide group is showing better response it does that mean amisulfide is better uh, drug or does that mean your sampling is actually biased towards those uh, brains who have a defect in brain which can be better uh, uh, used by amisulfide so ultimately your this whole rct has no meaning now let's take a established rct and check it in 1997 probably the most influential paper of psychiatry came into being kane style the trial of kane now there 60 mg haloperidol was compared to clozapine in a group of treatment resistant schizophrenia which treatment resistant schizophrenia was tried to structureize how they were given on a uh, given a criteria the kane's criteria that this patient should follow this should have this uh, amount of dysfunction in this 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 patient should have this two antibiotic uh, antipsychotic failed trial the total dose should be this and this but who said that this group of so called treatment resistant people schizophrenia is the same who said that these people have similar pathology in brain who said that these people who has failed two antipsychotics let's say someone has failed risperidone and olanzapine or someone let's go to act exact uh, kane criteria someone has failed trifluoroacetam and uh, olanzapine someone has failed risperidone and haloperidol so how can we say this group who has failed olanzapine and trifluoroacetam is similar to this group which has failed haloperidol and risperidone none of the brain pathologies are same none of the drugs mechanism of action are same so how we are making them together just because they are fruits isn't it a bit odd and that is how the things have gone this stands out so what is the solution there are solution i would talk about it wait for next class so the most worrying part is in medical legal cases given practice we need guidelines how can we deal with that we have to keep the guidelines when dealing with patients we would say this is guideline says but we are writing this because of 
this and we would talk with patients we would make them understand if patients are there with us then ultimately no legal problem would be faced and fortunately in psychiatry till today it is different than other specialties in other specialties <clears throat> your patient and relatives beat you in psychiatry patients beat you other relatives would try to protect you in psychiatry chronic patients die they thank the god in other specialties chronic patient die they kill the treatment provider it is still much better in psychiatry let's hope we can make them better by telling them the reality will it bring anarchy as all the diagnostic classification are indeed a compromise at this moment what should be the stance of gandagudi so they code this new molecular insight at present they undergraduate should understand this thing undergraduate should understand all they are talking are all they are being talked are nonsense but till dams and its psych- psychiatrist rule uh, neat pg till marrow and its psychiatrist rule neat pg till various coaching institutes and they are paid psychiatrists rule neat pg there is not going to be any change so they should remember the current illogical classification whether they want it or not ultimately that would come into it not reality not medical insight because i am not expecting sign of a divati house or sign of agarwal house to become knowledgeable today if you think i am become i am uh, speaking very harshly i am not i am just speaking the reality the reality is very harsh okay thank you baskar i think it was well explained as to why we are here and what is happening mm-hmm. uh, there is a question i think from uh, dr sanjay if the patients are having yes yes um, the hypothesis is they must be having at least some formal brain pathology this is how arthritis are done at present yes that is how arthritis are done the problem is the pathology of brain in case of our disorders are mostly molecular and being molecular they are unique in each patients so there is the common brain pathology doesn't exist even take two patients of schizophrenia and the name schizophrenia except the name schizophrenia none of their symptoms would match so standing there doesn't matter right. anyone else who has any questions i think we may have to wait for the next session uh for i think there yes. is a barrage of recording is available yeah uh okay. back to do you want to tell any last comments no i right. am expecting for a great controversy in next presentation i would wait for that <laughs> right okay then yeah we are all eagerly we will eagerly wait for the next session mm-hmm. i think where i'm sure diwali will come a bit early and lots of fireworks will be going on with this you... <laughs> and i i would love that <laughs> right okay sure right so with this few words and few comments and i will hand over the session to our organizers dr rashman right. right thank you thank you very much dr navesh thank you very much pastor as you mm-hmm. will you come with your own share of fireworks and uh, good fireworks we love fireworks <laughs> we love a good show and you definitely never disappoint but uh, i think uh, what you have raised uh, today during your 
uh, discussion and your discourse is a very relevant uh, set of questions or relevant set of inquiries into the way we uh, assume things to be in psychiatry. And uh, I think it's time for us to revise our perspective. And, and these are challenges which we as clinicians continue to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, it's completely relatable. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you are bringing this out in the open and uh, as, as much as it may displease certain academicians, but there are certain truths which need to be told and there are certain facts which need to be re-examined from time to time. Yes. Uh, we don't intend to rebuff anybody or we don't intend to uh, uh, shout anybody down, but we want everybody to have this phase of inquiry and curiosity in us, you know, which, which one has to constantly endeavor to persist with, endeavor to nurture if you want to continue to progress in the field of neuropsychiatry. And I think that is something which Master does in an exemplary manner. He promotes that, pushes that, he brobeats us into being that way when we don't want to do so. <laughs> so we are grateful for your effort and your zest and your enthusiasm and uh, uh, we are looking forward to your next session next Thursday. So we request all of you to come back for sure. The encore is going to be a lot more sensational than the appetizer. So we look forward to having you here. And I take this opportunity once again to thank Dr. Navesh for having taken valuable time out of the schedule. And uh, uh, we hope to have you back on the schedule yes. on this program on multiple occasions, sometimes uh, on the other side of the chair as well. And uh, thank you all for making the time for this evening session. We hope to look forward, uh, look, uh, we hope to see you all at the next session and look forward to having many such discourses in the future. And of course, thank you Sun Pharma for your unflinching support. I wish you all a great evening ahead. Until next Thursday. Thank Bye you. Bye. Bye.